Hi, and welcome to this special episode of Spotlight on UNBC as we shine the spotlight on what the university is doing to increase understanding of a wide variety of northern issues. We'll examine research and teaching that has a special emphasis on the social, environmental, and economic issues of northern BC and similar regions elsewhere. All of that is coming up on this special northern episode of Spotlight on UNBC. This special northern episode of Spotlight on UNBC is coinciding with the International Winter Cities Conference, which is happening in Prince George in February. The basic objective of that conference is to identify issues that are common in northern communities around the world and share common experiences. We have a lot of things in common with people all around the uh, circumpolar world. Our uh, political and geographic connections tend to be north-south. And so we relate, of course, uh, in Prince George to uh, the Lower Mainland, Vancouver, and uh, uh, we don't relate uh, all as strongly to places like Anchorage, Alaska, or, or uh, Yellowknife, or Whitehorse, or, or even Edmonton. It's in a different uh, political uh, uh, jurisdiction. It, um, it's, it's got a different geography. And, uh, but there are so many commonalities because of our weather, because of our climate, because we're both winter cities. And, and this uh, conference is going to reinforce the, those common denominators between the two of us and, and help us share our experiences to the benefit of both of us. About 400 delegates from around the north will be attending and many will bring expertise from places like Russia, Scandinavia and the Canadian North. But considerable expertise can be found right here at home, thanks in part to the northern focus of UNBC. UNBC faculty will be speaking at about half a dozen sessions, including the opening panel discussion on the future challenges for winter cities. UNBC has a number of research institutes that focus on northern themes, including the Northern Land Use Institute, the Child Welfare Research Centre, a National Centre of Excellence in Sustainable Forestry, a BC Centre of Excellence in Women's Health and the Institute for Social Research and Evaluation. This program will highlight research, international exchanges, degree programs, technology and recreation that all have a northern focus. The international component is key to the Winter Cities Conference and it's a big part of UNBC too. UNBC has a number of exchanges with other northern universities to give students the chance to experience firsthand the issues in other northern countries. Of course the biggest difference is the language and I think I have learned a lot. Hena Pateri and Yeni Arponen are currently attending UNBC on exchange from the University of Lapland in northern Finland. They are both taking social work. I think my country more over here and uh, I think that I will say them that there is something else now over there. It's not that Finland and you have to be here and you we are going to learn so much if we go to another country. I guess the like the issues are really much the same like here in Finland, like the northern issues, like the people are moving to like bigger cities and the north is like kind of isolated and and um, I don't know if they could like do some like research <laughs> together and just like like try to to do something about it because I don't think they should like just leave the north like like they should like encourage people to move up north and live there not just to leave the the, the that place like totally isolated and uh, I don't know if, like they have like similar issues so maybe they just could like learn from each other the exchange agreement with the University of Lapland is only one example. There are also northern exchanges with universities in Scotland, Russia and Sweden. One of the newest is with the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, which is a leader in natural resource education. 
if you look at the the um, economic uh, framework of northern Sweden versus northern British Columbia, there are many, many similarities. Uh, the communities up there are resource dependent. Many of them are heavily dependent on forestry or mining or fisheries in some instances. And uh, they're, they're, the issues are very, very similar. Staffan Lindgren grew up in Sweden and he benefited from a student exchange. The BC forest industry is often compared to the Scandinavian industry and the exchange may provide opportunities to learn from each other. I think there's been too much made of, of uh, Europe and Sweden in particular being ahead in terms of forestry because the issues are very, very different. So while we have similar problems and similar uh, issues to deal with in terms of resource management on the surface, the uh, framework is very, very different. We have to re remember that Sweden has been uh, practicing forestry for, for several hundred years. That means that uh, old growth management is just not an issue there. They have already made all the, the conversions to second growth and they are essentially dealing with a very, very different ecosystem than we are. And so I think that we can learn from maybe some of the uh, ways that they manage their second growth, but they can learn from us in terms of how we approach biodiversity issues, old growth management, and so on. So I think it's a two-way street. That two-way street is also helping Antonina Avakamova. She is from the Saha Republic in eastern Siberia and is at UNBC learning computerized mapping techniques for a Russian project on mapping traditional land use. It will be the land use uh, territories with the native peoples hunting, with the fishing. But in Yakut State University we have the uh, same laboratory but we don't have uh, people who know how to make maps in GIS. So I learn here and uh, when I come back to my university I can, le I can teach for, for the students how to do that. Resource management is an important environmental and economic issue for every northern community and UNBC is ideally situated to develop greater understanding of the many factors that contribute to effective environmental management. The university works with small and large players in the forest sector to help them practice effective and sustainable forestry. Within a few months, the university expects to begin construction of a million dollar forest research laboratory and students will gain real world skills in new research forests. UNBC also has a National Center of Excellence in Sustainable Forestry. So all in all, UNBC is developing considerable expertise in northern forestry. Our industry is in a downturn right now. We have to be global competitors. So research often provides innovations that can increase our efficiencies. Um, understanding the environment can possibly lead us to better access to wood. Uh, anything that helps us grow trees faster growth and yield, genetic type research, I mean, that can increase our industry's competitiveness. So it keeps going, and it's not only about forestry research, it's also any business students that come out of this university or social sciences, it, it's all extremely important to us. Right across from the main UNBC lab, a new enhanced forestry laboratory will likely begin taking shape in the spring. Slocan Forest Products has already contributed half a million dollars to that project. But research also happens in the field. Last year, we broadcasted a story about development of a new kind of harvesting that would allow logging in areas that are off limits to loggers because of their wildlife value. A rerun of that story now with some commentary later on whether it worked. Mountain caribou have specialized in a niche where they utilize these high elevation, old growth forests and forage on lichens that are growing abundantly on the branches in these trees. These lichens don't really develop until trees are 100 to 150 years old, and this traditionally has led to the impression, well, there's just, there's no compromise. We either have harvesting or we have caribou. 
this research is groundbreaking and that we're looking how alternative silvicultural systems, how small patches of trees as your unit of harvest or single trees being taken out, how different types of harvesting can retain the characteristics of the forest that allow caribou to have habitat and to have food. The patchwork of clear cuts you see here is typical in this area, but this is the new style of forest harvesting here using single tree selection and the creation of small patches. The logging that you're seeing here is uh, quite important to, um, to the kind of land use policy that's been developed around Prince George because it's important to remember that uh, if we were not harvesting in a, a, a different way in these areas, then we would not be logging around here at all. It's because of these animals. These alpine areas are prime caribou habitat, and the old style of clear cutting is not allowed anymore. It's been a problem for us because it was uh, classified as caribou medium habitat. A uh, decision that, uh, I guess, in the end, ultimately the government made that uh, that the caribou were uh, needed that habitat. And uh, the options were for medium zones that uh, if people could come up with an experimental method to harvest there, then the volume would be available to the licensees that, uh, that, that were assigned to those areas. So led to a lot of, lot of uh, discussion, of course, and debate about how to log there. And uh, that's, of course, what the research is doing for us, right? So would it be fair to say that without this kind of a research project, that area would be kind of off limits to you? Oh, it would definitely be off limits to us, yeah. The, uh, the medium habitat in the Prince George district is a, is a pretty significant chunk of real estate. Uh, basically, the mountains, uh, the slopes of the Rockies east of Prince George, um, total hectares I don't have off the top of my head, but there's a, a, a fairly large chunk of it. What we're trying to do here is to harvest a small number of trees in this stand, take out only about 25 to 30 percent of the timber volume in this stand, and to do it in a way that we are maintaining the integrity of the stand. We're maintaining a lot of big old trees, and we're maintaining the structure of the stand. This stand has a naturally clumpy structure in these clumps of trees support a lot of a lot of lichens so what we're trying to do is as much as possible leave the clumps intact and maintain the lichen biomass in here so that it'll continue to be winter range for caribou. Did it work? Here's biology professor Darwin Coxon. We've previously looked at either preserving areas for caribou habitat or clear-cut logging for for wood values. This research gives us an in-between path a way of having harvesting and retaining wildlife values. And what we're seeing is that in this site where we're retaining forest canopy, we're retaining food for the caribou through the, the type of partial cutting, that we expect there will be habitat available for those caribou in future years. It will take further studies to, to document to that use of the area, but from what we see now, this type of well, fairly new type for the central interior of harvesting does meet those objectives. We're now working on taking what we've learned from our harvesting in the past year and apply it in several new harvest blocks in the Robson Valley and in the Prince George area. UNBC research involves more than large-scale forestry operations. International Studies professor Heather Myers has been working with a number of small-scale forestry enterprises in northern BC to outline their particular issues and needs. The small-scale sector includes family sawmills, horse logging operations, and furniture or cabinet making. It's a project that was funded by FRBC, and it's looking at um, small-scale forest-based enterprises and what kinds of uh, contributions they make to northern communities. More than 60 local entrepreneurs took part in the study and they attended a recent workshop at UNBC. Part of the product of that workshop was coming up with a 10-point plan which outlined their concerns regarding the long-term viability and growth of their sector of the forest industry. If in this form we can tie a value to the job, over what, what our jobs that we create in a small business are worth compared to what the mills create. Perhaps we can get some FRBC money in here so that we can create more jobs because our, our jobs are worth more money. 
per cubic meter than, than the mills jobs are. And uh, this will give us a forum, you can say it legitimizes us. I mean, we have now have the backing of, say, a university to say that this is what we found. Is far greater because he's... Some of the things they talked his, about his, uh, uh, and raised were things like um, uh, just the opportunity to have regular meetings with the district managers of, of forestry in, in their districts. So it happens in some districts and it doesn't happen in others. And there was a feeling that the large mills have more access to the district managers, so their needs are, are better known. But in fact, there is this fairly significant smaller scale sector too, and they would like to have that sort of access too. So that when questions come up to do with policy or new programs or FRBC uh, decisions that they, um, or a thing, uh, whatever, that they would, have, they would have input. For local cabinet maker Helmut Koch, local access to high quality lumber is a major issue. Okay. Cabinet making is different than uh, rough carpentry or working with two by fours or on the construction site. Before I had an apprentice and a journeyman working and didn't get enough work, I had to lay him off. I'm sorry. There will also be a, a workshop uh, towards the end of the process which will bring in other government uh, representatives, some financing and banking kinds of people and other people who have an influence or could have an influence on the sector so that they can hear firsthand what some of the concerns and the solutions, proposed solutions are that, that these uh, entrepreneurs are talking about. For many northern communities, isolation has hampered development. The sheer distance to major centres has often made it more difficult for northerners to access services like education. Since UNBC opened in 1994, the number of high school graduates going on to university has doubled, but barriers still exist, and UNBC is using technology to make education more accessible to more people. English professor Stan Beeler and a number of graduate students are working to create their own software that will allow courses to be delivered more effectively via the internet. Now the northern focus of this is that we are working with less than reliable networks in the north. The, no the networks in southern, there, is, there are a lot of really good packages that work in a southern environment, but they don't have the kind of uh, inherent redundancy that we're trying to build in. For instance, when our package finds that uh, the transmission lines aren't working, it will immediately revert to the CD-ROM and start drawing information off a CD-ROM drive. It'll, it'll just have Besides being I built for really northern done. infrastructure, the courses will also be built to be easy to use for both students and teachers. We did one of the web courses um, the first year that the English department offered them. And we were in the class with people from Fort St. John and Quesnel and all over northern BC. And I think that's what's really neat about the web stuff is that people who wouldn't necessarily have access to the UMBC campus can do things like that. The Borealis Group of Prince George is a partner in the project and President Clayton Gray sees a big private sector application of the new software. One company that we talked about in particular uh, had a $1.4 million budget per year and 900000 of it was traveling in the north. That's traveling from here to McBride or uh, Prince George to Hazleton or Hazleton to Terrace in the winter and that becomes uh, treacherous at times. And I think if we still had that contact and maybe instead of a five-day course it was a two-day course and three days of it was over the internet. That's where we see it happening. And how big is the market? Uh, Canadian statistics state that there'll be nine, it'll be a nine billion dollar industry by the year 2003. UNBC is also developing other technology for regional course delivery. The LearnLink software may allow students to participate in a class almost as if everyone was in the same room. Using microphones and speakers, they can have conversations with professors and students who may be hundreds of kilometers away. The students do tend to get a lot more out of this simply because they are more um, involved in the classroom, involved in a setting with other students. Even though they're not physically there, they can indicate that they'd like to speak and they can have an open discussion. Um, amongst people. If the student has a question, they simply have to click this button and it'll raise their hand. And I'll demonstrate, and it'll turn green, and then you can lower your hand. 
And what will happen is the instructor will see on their list that the student has raised their hand, at which point the, student can, the instructor can hand the floor over to the student to discuss what their question is. Um, the on-air button indicates that that particular person is the one who has the ability to speak and be heard by the other participants. In this case, it's me. Down in the center box, we have a listing of everyone that's partaking in this class. Linda Williams, who's the instructor, and myself is logged in as a student. If there were more students in this class, we'd see a listing of all their names. If you wanted to see what the agenda for the class is, you can click on the Agenda tab here on the left, and up comes the resources and information that the instructor has prepared for that class. And the students can look at that at any time that they would like. Uh, below the box, it shows how many hands are raised and how many participants are in the class. In this case, zero and two. As well, if I find the instructor is going a little too fast or a little too slow for the course, a student can select the pace at which they find it's going, and the instructor sees the feedback on the other end. I've just indicated to go a little bit slower. The bottom box, two boxes, is called the text chat. And that's for communicating with the rest of the class in a text environment um, and not in an audio environment. And one just simply has to type their question at the bottom. And by clicking the send button, the instructor will receive that question, at which point the instructor can respond, or any of the other students can respond to that question. And that's pretty much everything on the palette. We haven't got all the machines deployed in the regions yet. We haven't got all the partnerships in place. And then you also have to get together the courses that you're going to be offering out there. You can't just sort of say tomorrow, oh, well, we'll just you know, grab these faculty members and get them. They need to want to do something. So we're growing into it. And we're hoping that it's going to be adopted naturally by students and staff as a useful thing, as an augmentation to what they're doing. UNBC has launched the new public lecture series focusing on issues in northern development. The series is being supported by the Leon and Thea Kerner Foundation and is presenting speakers on global warming, environmental co-management in Russia, and health care in northern communities. It's a good time to have the series because we've just uh, begun a new program in northern studies, a new BA program, the first major program in uh, Canada in Northern Studies mm -hmm. and this also is the uh, semester for the Winter Cities uh, conference to be on in Prince George. So this lecture series uh, hooks up with a number of things that are going on both at UNBC and in the community and it's a lecture series that's designed to bring community and university together. Glaciologist Roy Kerner kicked off the series with a presentation of how glacial ice contains information on past climate change. The upcoming presentations are indicated on your screen. As UNBC grows, it's developing programs with a particular northern focus. That was evident this past September when UNBC created Canada's first bachelor's degree program in northern studies. It'll also be evident this coming September when UNBC will launch a new degree specialization in energy development. That program will prepare students to work in the oil and gas industry and other parts of the growing energy sector. The energy program will be offered primarily in Fort St. John, which is the headquarters of the B.C. oil and gas industry. UNBC history professor John Swanger, who teaches courses in Fort St. John, has developed a course on the particular history of oil and gas development in the Peace River region. It's easy, for instance, to do British Columbia history and forget that the Peace River country has a different economic base and a different economic history than the rest of the province. And the simple fact is, is that oil and gas exploration is the newest, biggest drawing industry right now in this region. We've been historically an agricultural region. Uh, there has been some mining here and there's been some 
pursuit of, of uh, the forestry industry here. But the, the biggest one and the one that probably is going to have the longest impact is, in, is gas and oil, specifically gas exploration, natural gas. And they've known that there was gas here uh, certainly going back to the 1920s. Full information about the new energy specialization degree is available on the web at www.unbc.ca or contact the university for a program brochure. A university is more than the sum of research and teaching. Recreation is also a big part of the university experience for many students, and even leisure has a northern focus at UNBC. The great snow conditions and proximity to a major training facility have attracted many top cross-country skiers and biathletes to UNBC. UNBC students Barb Sharp and Mike Maleshi are two of Canada's top junior biathletes, a sport which combines cross-country skiing and target shooting. They've both been in training for major national and international competitions. Uh, we're leaving tomorrow morning to go to Burberry, Alberta, mm -hmm. where it is the trial races for the world junior team. And then I think we both have a very good chance of making that team. So if we make that team, we'll head out on... February 7th to Slovenia and we'll be there for a couple of weeks. Come home and we'll be back here for a week and we'll train for the Canada Winter Games and we'll head off to the Canada Winter Games in Newfoundland for a week. And then we'll come back for a week and we have the national championships in Canmore later in March. The major local training facility at Otway is connected to UNBC by a new trail system. The presence of a good ski area, high caliber coaching and a university all in the same city is unique in Western Canada. Even in Salmon Arm we had to go an hour and a half up to Silver Star. Yeah. So this is pretty close. Plus where we're living right now we can ski out our back door which makes it easy too. Um, but somewhere like Canmore if you want to go to UFC it's an hour drive all the way into the university and then you got to come all the way back. Now with the university being in here full time, athletes could actually come to school here and, uh, and uh, get a degree and still compete at a very high level. Um, it's not, when you're young like that, it's I think good to be an all around person and do school and do high athletics. Yeah. It just makes life a little bit easier for you because a lot of people stay in the sport for yeah, 10, 12 years and then they come out and it's very hard to go back to school. Well, it's very clear that Prince George is the best place in, in the province to be a university athlete in ski. Cross-country ski coach Pete Saar sees the opportunity for even greater development in Prince George. The cross-country ski club at UNBC has big plans for developing trails around UNBC and hosting some national races. Student Dallas Eng of Whitehorse was even accepted to participate in the World University Games. Uh, when they told me that I did qualify, I finally did qualify because it was the ultimate um, I was pretty excited about going and thought, oh, it's going to happen now, and then, but it just it didn't work out well, the timing. We're actually developing a, a system of, of cross-country ski trails right out in the back of Forest for the World, for instance, uh, right on campus. The trail will come right down onto campus so the students can ski right out of residence, and we'll have, um, hopefully in the future, uh, over about um, upwards of 30 kilometers of uh, groomed cross-country ski trails. That, that will be multi-use as well uh, for recreational skiers, for athletes training, for um, snowshoers, um, people walking can still use the trails, people walking their dogs and so forth. The fact that uh, uh, this opportunity is here, I, it's you know really the only place in the West you can actually truly uh, pursue both higher education and uh, skiing at a fairly high level. Thanks for watching this special episode of Spotlight on UNBC, focusing on how the university is helping to increase understanding of major northern issues. A reminder that if you're interested in degree programs or research at UNBC, check out our webpage at www.unbc.ca.